Harry from G-Man Ninja here, and welcome back to our comprehensive sentence correction series where we try to cover everything you need for a sentence correction of the GMAT or the executive assessment. In this episode, I'm going to be talking to you about subject verb errors. Now, on the face of it, this is a very easy topic. If you've got a singular subject in the sentence, you need to have a singular verb. And if you have a plural subject, you need to have a plural verb. If I said to you something like she is going to the beach, you'd be absolutely fine with it because she is singular, is a singular and no problem there at all. Whereas if I said to you, she are going to the beach, you'd look at me very funny. And if that came up as an option in GMAT sentence correction, you'd just cross it out and we'd be on to the next thing. So we won't be spending much time looking at the con concept itself. However, the GMAT will do its best to throw a few wrinkles into these questions. They might turn the subject into what we call a compound subject, or they might invert the sentence, or they might just throw a huge, great long sentence at you and try and bamboozle you with the length of the length of the sentence you've got to deal with. So what we'll look at today is how to deal with those disguises. And coming up in this video, I've got one example on the board where in a second I'll show you how to think about these sentences. Then I've got a shortened version of an official question to give us a bit more practice before we finish with two official questions. By the time we get to the end of this video, I would like you to have a good idea about the range of ways the GMAT can try and hide these subject verb issues. Now, a bit of a disclaimer on the difficulty. Purely because we're talking about these subject verb issues in this video, you're going to be looking out for them. The difficulty comes when you don't know that they're coming and you just read right by them because it sounds good, right? So I'm not expecting you to find the questions in these videos very difficult. What I'm hoping is that by looking at the issues that can come up in a question, that when you go back to doing the full official questions yourself, the things that make you think about subject verb issues begin to pop off the page at you. You see them as soon as you see them, you should be able to know what to do with them. All right, so without any further ado, let's get into this first sentence behind me. I'll start by reading it out, and as I read it, just try to decide whether you think there are any subject verbs issues in it, and then we'll talk about how to break it apart as if it was in the exam. All right, so what we've got going on here is I've got a tray of strawberries, which are delicious summery fruit, cost more when bought from the supermarket than when bought directly from the farmer. So when dealing with subject verb issues, the first thing we need to do or we need to find the subject of the sentence. We need to find the verb. Now, don't let this modifier in the middle lead you off track. Yes, strawberries are delicious summary fruit, but the subject of this sentence is the whole bit, the tray of strawberries. Now we go find the verb, and that's going to be down here. The tray of strawberries costs more. Now, you hear about the cost is a plural verb. Strawberries cost more, strawberries cost less, depending on what you're doing. Strawberries would work with cost, but a tray of strawberries is a singular, so that's not going to work with this verb. If this said a tray of strawberries costs more when bought from the supermarket than when bought directly from the farmer, that would be fine because cost is singular. We need singular verbs to go with singular subjects. We need plural verbs. We need a plural subject. So in these sentences, as we go through this video, Every time, try and find the subject, try and find the verb, and just see if they match. All right, so what we'll do now is I will get the first example up on the screen for you. This is going to be a shortened example with only two answer choices. Give you about 30 seconds, take a look at it, we'll come back and strip this one apart. All right, I'll see you back here very soon. All right, as ever, if you need a little more time to look at this one, feel free to pause the video here, but I'm going to take the question away so that we can take a look at this one together. All right, so first trip back example, yeah, we've only got two answer choices and there is a very obvious difference between the two. I've got have grown in A, I've got has grown in B. Also at the end, I've got are bringing in A and I've got is bringing in B. So A is definitely talking about a plural subject, B is definitely talking about a singular subject, and we just need to go and figure out what the subject is so that we can decide between these two. Now there's a couple of different options you might go for, and you might be tempted by this, all things antique at the beginning. All things antique, yeah, definitely plural there. So if that's the subject, 
that's going to take us towards A. But for a couple of reasons, that's probably not the way to go. First of all, think about it in terms of meaning. Again, the GMAT uses meaning in a very literal sense. All things antique have grown. We're talking about pieces of furniture, antique fixtures and fittings literally growing. Again, from a meaning sense, that doesn't make sense. And from a grammatical sense, the all things antique is linked to this bit at the start of the sentence. Something has or have grown out of America's fascination with all things antique. So the, the antique things are not the subjects of the sentence there. So don't get drawn into that. This is actually an example of what we might call a flipped sentence, where the subject is going to come after the verb. In this case, the subject for this sentence is the market. A market has grown. Well, that makes sense. We can have markets growing. We can have markets shrinking. So a market, singular, has grown. And a market is bringing back the chaise longue and the overstuffed sofa. So in that case, our subject for this sentence is a singular. And so we should cross out A and B is going to be our answer to this one. So as you can see, there are, well, this is the first of the different ways that the GMAT will use different ways to hide these subject verb issues. This one, the subject is going to come after the verb. And there's a couple of other ways we'll look at in a minute. So what we'll do now is I will get the first of the full um, official examples up here on the screen for you to have a look at. As we've said before in some of the other videos, there are other things or potentially other things in these sentences you could look at. But because this is a subject verb video, you might as well go for that first. So I'll get the next example up on the screen and we'll see you back here in a couple of minutes time. Okay, now's your chance to pause the video if you need a little more time to look at this one. But for now, I'm going to take it away so that we can work through it together. All right, I'm just going to drop back to that disclaimer we had at the beginning of the video. I'm not expecting too many of you to have found this question too difficult, purely because subject verb errors are very easy to deal with when you've spotted them. Now, in a question where you don't know a subject verb error is coming up, maybe it's not going to be so easy to see in this video because we're telling you this is the subject verb video. You kind of know what's coming. So as I say, I don't expect too many of you to have found this question too difficult, but stick with us because what I'm aiming to do is go through the, the, the ways the GMAT tries to hide these problems. Hopefully you get a good, better idea of them. And when you go back to doing the full questions, these things begin to jump off the page at you. And as we said, once you see them, they're fairly easy to deal with. All right, so in, in this question, as we said, this is the subject verb video. So I'm going to start looking for those issues first. Hopefully you spotted the change in the verbs at the start of each of these answer choices. We've got a was, a were, a has, a have. So we're playing on this subject verb issue. We're playing on this singular plural issue already. 
Now, the subject of this sentence is at the start of it, in this first, first part before the first dash. We've got Thomas Eakin's powerful style and his choices of subject. This is what we might call a compound subject. I've got his style and his choice as a subject. And these two things are going to work together to perform some action. Now, if that's not convincing enough, on top of that, his choices of style is already plural. So my subject here, two things, the second one's plural. This is definitely a plural subject. So I'm going to have to use plural verbs. And so in that case, I can get rid of a because the word was is the verb is was and that's a singular word. I can also get rid of C. Has is a singular and I'm left with B, D, and D. B and D are explicitly plural, were and have are plural verbs. Had can be used for how a had been um, is the past perfect and can be used for both singular or plural issues. All right, so those are the, there's the, those are the answer choices I can get rid of for explicit subject verb issues. Now we can go look at some of the other things. And I'm going to start with D because at the end of it, we've got this, it was... Now I'm really going to fo yeah, focus on the, the it here. We, fo we said at the start, Thomas Eakin's powerful style and his choice as a subject is a plural. Then we've got had been as disturbing in his own time as it was. There isn't really anything for this singular pronoun to refer to. So while this isn't a strictly subject verb issue, for almost the same reason as we got rid of A and we got rid of C, we're really looking for a plural here. This isn't a subject verb issue, it's a singular plural issue. Same reason as A and C, we can get rid of D. And now we're down to A versus, sorry, B versus E. Now, between these two, there, there are a couple of issues, a couple of different things we could look at. I'm going to start with the verbs at the beginning. Were as disturbing, that's using the simple past tense, whereas in E, have been as disturbing, that's using what's called the present perfect. Now, I'm not going to go into the details on the tenses here. There's going to be another video in the series that deals with that. But in this case, what we can say is the present perfect would be used for something that started in the past and continues into the present. And in E, that's not going to make much sense because we want to say that these things have been as disturbing in his own time. We don't want to use the present perfect because that would suggest that this disturbingness continues into the present, but then the sentence limits it to in his own time. So the use of the present perfect doesn't work in E, and that's enough for me to cross B out, sorry, cross E out, and for me to say that B is going to be my answer here. All right, so this is, a, this is an example of using a compound subject. Yeah, his powerful style might appear to be a singular, but as soon as we get that and in there and we get his choice as a subject as well, these two things doing the action together, then it has to be a plural. And as we've seen, B is going to work out to be our answer here. All right, I'm going to get this, the second and final full example up on the screen for you now. This one's a bit trickier. So take your time. We'll give you two minutes and we'll see you back here to go through that one.
Okay, for the final time today, if you need a little more time to take a look at this one, feel free to pause the video here, but I'm going to take this question away so that we can work through it together. All right, so as we've been saying all along, subject verb issues are sometimes a little difficult to spot when they're just in a question hidden away. But because we're in this video, we know what we're looking for. I'm hoping that these things are beginning to jump off the page at you and you're beginning to see some of the issues in this one. Now, in this question, there are some other things going on. We There's an and in these answer choices. We could talk about parallelism. Maybe we'll need to by the time we get to the end of this. But what I'm hoping that you saw was a test, a tests, that these verbs are changing at the end of each of the underlying portions. And so a test is a plural verb, a test is a singular. Let's go find the subjects in each case and see if we can use that to make an elimination. After that, we'll see if we need to deal with anything else. So I'm just gonna start working through alphabetically and we see where we end up. So in this case, we've got a test, we've got a plural verb. Now let's go find the subject and see if it matches up. So this first clause, while most of the early known bull courts in the Mesoamerica date to 900 to 400 BC, that's not giving us a subject, that's just giving us the introduction to this sentence. But then we get into this bit, waterlogged latex bulls found at El Manati and representations of bull players painted on ceramics found at San Lorenzo. If you remember back to the last question, we've got two things, there's that and in the middle, we've got one of these compound subjects again, in this case, both of the parts of that compound subject are themselves plural. We've definitely got a plural subject here. The plural verb matches. I'm going to leave A for now. All right, moving moving into B, you know, we've got a test. Now we've got a singular verb. In this case, we've got that and there. I've got the waterlogged latex balls. I've got the painting of representations of ball players on ceramics. So again, we've got that compound subject. I've got two things, both performing the action, but I've only got a singular verb. So for that reason, let's get rid of B. Now we could talk about the parallelism in B, but I think the subject verb issue, partly because it's the subject of this video, but also because it's an easier way to make the elimination, that's where I'm gonna stick with. That's enough to get rid of B. C, okay, we've changed this second part of this, but we've still got the and, I've still got waterlogged latex balls and ceramics painted with representations, and I've still got that singular verb. So I've got the compound subject, both parts of that compound subject are both plural, I've definitely got a plural subject for the singular verb, C's got to go. All right, D, well, we're, now we're going to change the start of this, the finding of waterlogged latex balls. Okay, the waterlogged latex balls, still plural, but the finding of them, that's going to be singular the finding of the balls and the painting of representations of ball players. Okay, so each bit, the finding and the painting, each bit of those is still going to be singular, but I've got that and in the middle. You push the two of them together, the finding and the painting together as one of those compound subjects is plural. I've still got a singular verb here, so D's got to go. Now, this is the point where I need you to keep your wits about you. Please don't switch off. Please don't go onto autopilot. Don't just look at this, think that it looks at so the finding of waterlogged latex balls. E looks very similar to D, but now I've got the plural subject I was looking for. E's right, let's go find something else. Like, well, let's slow down. Let's take a closer look at E. This time the bit after the and has also changed. So and of representations. So I'm going to check the parallelism and see what of representations could be parallel to. I'd say there it's going to be the finding, so the finding of waterlogged latex balls and of representations. So I've got the finding of two things. Now the finding is the thing that's going to be doing the action here. As we said with D, the finding, even though we're finding multiple things, the finding is singular, but I've got a plural verb now. So yeah, we've changed from a test to a test, but because of the other changes in the sentence that we've made, E is still wrong. So I'm going to cross E out, and the only answer choice left is going to be A, which is going to be our answer. Now, as you said, the compound subjects throughout here, but really I would say that this is where the GMAT is creating the difficulty just by making this question long. There's just a lot of words here. And you open this question up and you, you just start panicking because of the length. It's like, I don't have long to get through this. Whereas with these long questions, if you just take your time, read them carefully, there should be things that begin to jump off the page at you. As we said with this one, the difference between a test and a test, that's a nice, easy one to hopefully spot. Then you can go find the subject, get into it. And as we've seen through this subject verb issue has got us all the way to the end of this one. All right, so I hope this is, helps, 
helps you identify the things in sentences and the, the ways the GMAT can hide these subject verb issues. As we said up at the start, they could have a compound subject, they could invert the sentence, or they could just make the sentence really long. All right, I hope that has helped everybody. Um, lovely to see you all here. We hope to see you again at one of our other videos. Have a great day.